Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 310, featuring the third installment of my interview with Anthony and Nicola Caulfield, the producers of From Bedrooms to Billions and the Amiga Years documentaries. This part of the uh, episode, we talk more about the Amiga, why it was so much more successful in the, U in the UK uh, than the US. We talk about the CD32 and the impact of Nintendo and Sega's consoles on the UK games industry. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Anthony and Nicola Caulfield. Well, it looks like the film is doing really great publicity there. I saw the, you had a clip or an interview, I guess, on, was it BBC Breakfast or some show like that? And, yes. And that was a, I don't know anything about that show, but I noticed right after you, you guys were off, they said they were bringing on Peter Davidson. This, <laughs> I mean, this must be a huge show. I mean, what a great break. And you know what was really impressive, too, was those hosts and the hostess on that show, they knew, like she picked up, I think, a ZX81 uh, and she knew what it was. No, Commodore 64. That's, That's it. So she yeah. picked up the Commodore 64 and she knew all about it. And I, that just blew my mind. I can't imagine in America having a, you know, a breakfast show like that. They would be like, computer? What's a computer? <laughs> they were very, very good, weren't they? And they were yeah. geeky, and they yeah. were really into it. They were, you know, because they do that thing where they, we were the, we were on twice. We were the, the last slot before the sort of main hardcore news. So, you know, it's, but getting on breakfast television is a big, big break. Um, and certainly with the film coming out, and they... When they, you know, they wheel you in, and the lights are low, and they while while the newsreader is reading, and both presenters were like, "Wow, it's a Commodore 64," and they were literally like, like twelve years, amazing, twelve years old all over again. Yeah. Suddenly it was like five, four, three, two, one. And then they had to be all serious and go. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was quite amazing. But we find we find it really interesting that so many people in um, in British broadcast, they they just don't recognise. Um, it's not just about the British games industry, but they just don't realise how tiny broadcast is when compared to the video games industry. They genuinely just think that video games is still played by a couple of couple of hippies in the back of the room, you know, a couple of niche geeks or something, and they don't they don't realise how big it is. Long-haired guys in basements with a bookshelf a full of old cliche. games. Yeah. <laughs> what a cliche! <laughs> But it's true. It, it's true. It, that's it's a um, a stereotype that um, it seems to be more of a UK problem that they there's we had, we went through this whole thing about all games are violent. It's like well, uh, we need to ban we need to ban video games because they're violent. Well, ban magazines because magazines have violent. There's some you know there's there's magazines with guns yeah, I think, in. So. Yeah, when anything happens, it's always like they play violent video games. It's like yeah, but they could have been reading like guns and ammo or something. It's it's not all down to games, and so, we don't. Yeah. We also well, don't, don't have the guns. You don't have as many guns there. I don't think. Is that? Is that? I'm pretty sure that's true, right? No, we don't. No. No. It's not no. like here where everybody's got at least two shotguns and a, yeah. you know, AK-47 in the in their truck. Bazookas. <laughs> no, they. Yeah, I just they've... had to sell my bazooka. It's really sad. <laughs> it's a good home defense weapon, a bazooka. <laughs> Now they've got some stra they've got some strange views over here about about yeah. video games. It's they're trying to there's a lot of people working hard trying to change those those attitudes. It's just uh, we we always find it where a broadcaster will say, oh, you know, we don't like games because people are, people are not watching television when they're playing games. And say, so, well, but you produce a lot of documentaries about music and books, and you can't read a book and watch television at the same time. So it's a silly argument, and I think it's probably just. Um, there's a there's an element of shock when you sort of say to them, you know, do you know that the the games industry turned over a hundred billion dollars last year? It broke a hundred billion. You and, know, well, so. another thing in this country as well that they're doing at the moment is um, the government are really trying to push get youngsters back into programming. Yeah. You know, so that's a big drive. So I do think that media has to pick up on that. It is getting covered more in the news now because it's quite. A big thing that that children are programming again. I mean, our son is at school. He loves it. He comes home because I've done this. This is moving across the screen and everything. And I think it's great for kids. That so he's eight years old, so that's about the right age too, right? Yeah, yeah. And he loves it. 
it might just be one little thing moving across the screen. He's just so excited. Do you know what? One of the things I, I we found was when we were making the movie, the original from Bedroom Civilians, was that a lot of the developers were got got obsessed with the idea of programming because the television, you know, our age group, was this mystical box that you had no control over. You know, programs were broadcast into it. You sat and watched it. Maybe you had a choice of changing a few channels, but effectively you couldn't manipulate it or do anything with it other than turn it off. And suddenly you had this little keyboard, this little computer that you could plug into it, and with a little bit of skill you could suddenly project things up onto the screen. And I think that was a really fundamental moment. I think a lot of a lot of kids got obsessed with that idea and I mean obsessed in a good way because it it channeled their focus um, massively and helped kickstart an entire generation mm. and that was going on in other countries as well I know from bedrooms just deals with the UK industry but you know it's a rise and fall story but it was yeah, going the on. same thing I was just interviewing the Alexei Pazhanov of Tetris you know, he was in the Soviet wow. Union and it was the same exact story you know about he described out when he first did his program and how he's you know I, I can control this thing and that was so exciting <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's great. I hope we can have some similar uh, government. I guess it's a government initiative there to get more kids. That's I hope right. we can have something similar in the, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I had John here on my show not not too long ago. I guess it was back in uh, 2011. I remember one of the things that uh, he got on the spiel or rant or whatever you want to call it about how <laughs> I'm kind of putting words in his mouth here, uh, but he's talking about how the consoles kind of dumbed down everything and console gamers just were never as smart as the computer gamers were and they you know weren't ready for more you know they basically everybody everything had to get simpler to sort of cater to them you know i noticed in from bedrooms to billions there was i I sensed a little negativity when these folks were talking about you know the the sega and the nintendo and it it brought some changes but not necessarily changes they liked (laughs) you know to uh, to the industry so i mean i wonder if you could sort of you know do you agree with uh with that idea about I call it the endumbening effect. <laughs> but do you see anything like that, or is that just sort of giant? <clears throat> well, it's very. If you think about it, when this, when the we're not saying that the consoles. Um, this is pre PlayStation, by the way. We're talking um, the um, the SNES um, and the um, the Mega Drive, <clears throat> the Genesis. Sorry, as you as you know it in the US. Um, what you effectively had was you had a whole generation growing up through the 80s that had programmable computers, whether they be Commodore 64, Amiga, Atari ST, BBC Mike, whatever they were. You were able to buy a box for a couple of hundred pounds, for, you know, three or four hundred dollars, take it home, learn to program, and technically, with a bit of luck, release a game, find a publisher, and you can get it out there. The problem with the consoles was uh, was several issues. One is that they were closed, which meant you couldn't go and buy a console and start programming on it. You had to get a development system, which means you had to... Re- Suddenly, the barriers of entry went very, very high. So you needed money. Yeah, you couldn't have a 60... Yeah. Like, for example, Matthew Smith, that we were talking about earlier, could go down to the local high street, the computer shop, buy a computer, come home, and in a few weeks, write a game. With the consoles, that changed because it was you had to register as a developer, and you also had to submit your game. Once you were registered, you then had to get a development kit, which you had to pay for, which was thousands of thousands of dollars. So, of course, that meant that if you were a new a newcomer to the industry, forget it, because you didn't have that sort of money, and you had no track record to get that. So immediately that cut off the new blood coming in. The second thing that happened was once you uh, did get that registration, your game then had to be uh, approved by um, by um, Nintendo and by the uh, the actual uh, manufacturer themselves. Um, and of course, at any point they could refuse it, which meant that you could have spent six months a year funding yourself to make that game. So the risks are continually going up if you think about it. So you would then be looking for a publisher to fund you to make that game. So if you could find a publisher that perhaps believed in your idea, that was happy to fund you and of course maybe a couple of different a, cu- a couple of people in your team for maybe a year's development. Um, and then you had the you're not going to want to yeah. You're not that's one issue, but the other thing is the cartridge manufacturing had to be ordered in advance. And if you got the numbers wrong, so let's say 
completely hypothetical situation, <clears throat> Batman Returns is coming out in 1992. It's going to be a bit... You, you predict, you buy the rights to it six months or a year before the film comes out. So you're thinking, well, I expect this to be a big hit because Warner Brothers are going to do a big marketing campaign. It's Tim Burton. It's going to be a big thing. So we're going to need to get this license. So you've spent maybe a million dollars on the on the Batman license. So you've done that, and then you're going to have to hire the development team. That's another million plus. So you've got all this risk. When the game is nearing completion, you're not going to want to take too many chances with the game because you don't want to do anything too risky in case people don't like it. So you tend to just keep the... Don't be too in innovative. Keep it sort of relatively safe. And then six months... three or, Sorry, four or five months before the game is due to come out, you've got to pre-order the cartridges. Now, if you get the number wrong and you order, say, 100,000 cartridges, and they're pretty expensive, you know, we're talking maybe $15 a cartridge. They weren't, they, you didn't get many discounts. It was expensive to make them. If you got that number wrong, and you ordered 100,000, and those 100,000 sold out in three days, because the game is brilliant and the magazines review it, it will take you three months to restore those cartridges, to order another batch. So you'd overorder. You'd say, well, just in case it's a hit, I'd better order a million cartridges. So you suddenly started to find that... You had to kind of hedge your bets. Hedge the bets. Don't take too many chances. Yeah. Go for... So you saw a huge number of licenses. And this is... I'm talking from a European, uh, a predominantly a UK perspective here. And we're not saying there weren't great games. We're not saying the consoles were bad or anything else like that. But what did happen was you suddenly had these... A lot of these talented programmers just think, oh, and get out, because it just was too risky. And the publishers were going for safe bets and not going for original ideas. And that all changed when the PlayStation I think, it, but out. even at that time, the publishers were suffering, because, well, certainly in this country, there was no investment. Our, our banks wouldn't invest in that, because they never saw it as a very, uh, you know, they looked at it and thought, that's too risky. To put millions into into a games company, but the U.S. did invest. It's very different, actually. different in America. The U.S. actually, and that really changed the things. <laughs> to uh, their credit, yeah. to their credit, they saw, and maybe it's they just, saw a business there. The the mm. U.K. can British can be very risk averse sometimes, mm. um, and and when some when it got to the point in the early 1990s when the the money needed to get put down, where okay, this games industry is going to be big. You know, this really starting to see some money. When we're seeing games like Sonic the Hedgehog coming out, which is selling millions of units, and it, that's where really the British publishers needed to put the serious money down and say, right. And there were a couple of, don't get me wrong, there were a couple of companies like Ocean and a few others that really did get some big titles out there and released. But you started seeing a large number of other British publishers just fall away. And also just, we're, we're getting bought up by big American publishers because they had the money and they saw the talent and thought, right, okay, well, we'll have that talent. You know, it's good good business. But, yeah, it did change the industry. So it was a combination of things. The cartridges yeah. meant that you had to put a lot of money down up front, a lot more risk, which means you're not going to be so, you could take so many chances. And and also the cl the, the more difficult development systems to work with and to, to, to get licenses for. However, Commodore, Commodore def definitely didn't help the situation. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no. If they if they had actually come out with a um, if the CD32 or their next their next machine had come out as it should have done, it, some people will say that it actually would have actually got there. It was way ahead of the PC, and it would have just been this. And, and there's another thing that we actually dis we've actually recently discovered as well. Now, if anybody watches this program in six months, we might have changed our opinion on this, but we're, we're, we don't think so. A warning up. What <laughs> happened in the US is the Amiga sold quite badly in the US, whereas in Europe it was a completely different story. It sold really well. Um, and One of the problems in the US was that the Commodore 64 had sold incredibly well and the Commodore, Mani the Commodore sales team got a little bit lazy and they started doing deals with, with organizations like Toys R Us and what was the other one? Um, Toys R Us. We've only just discovered this. Came Walmart. Walmart. Yeah. Well, basically, not the, and it irritated the computer shops because the computer shops were the heart of the business, and some of the Commodore marketing team were saying, "Look, we've got to get the, we've got to, we did really well with the Commodore 64 because we engaged the computer stores, and the computer stores want to sell it for, for 200, you know, for 300 dollars." 
Whereas what happened was Commodore did a deal with Toys R Us where they said where the Commodore 64 suddenly was available for $99. And Toys R Us were making $1. It was being sold to Toys R Us at $98 a unit and Toys R Us would just simply put $1 on top. Yeah, because they were making money out of the software. Yeah, just to sell the there. software. Yeah. So what it did was it, frust it, it, it infuriated the, by that point, the thousands of, of successful computer stores, independent computer stores, all over the US, and they've started to refuse to take Commodore products, and that included the Amiga, and then they refused to to really engage with the Amiga. Well, also Commodore tried to wanted the Amiga to be sold as a True, cheaper yeah. product as well. You know, it just and completely it, backfired. They got it wrong. And do you know who stepped into the gap in the market? Do you know who took advantage of this massive series of own goals that Commodore did? Nintendo. They suddenly saw. Ah, there's a gap that where where the Commodore 64 was reaching the end of its life, and it was dropping away. Suddenly, there was a gap for an 8-bit machine that, would, if if it was well priced, could just get in there with some good. And of course, Nintendo had some great games, and suddenly the NES took off in the US. And then anything that does well in the US will then eventually come over to Europe, and they bang into the US, got a thriving thing going and then gradually came over and pretty much took over the uh, Europe as well. So there were some really fundamental things, but Commodore, unfortunately... They could have been really they fantastic. Could have, they could have had it all. Yeah. They had the technology, so, yeah. they had the product, they had the technology, they made some, they made some serious mistakes, actually. Yeah. And we've got some interviews coming up in the yeah. next few weeks. I think out of one of the, you know, as, as one of the maybe a dozen or so Amiga owners in the U.S., you know, it was so frustrating. You know, to have this machine and be playing games like Defender of the Crown or whatever. And then all my friends would have the Nintendo or maybe the, the Sega system. And you'd be like, it's a joke, right? <laughs> but there's, you know, pretty soon it got to be where if I wanted any new games, it had to come from, uh, you know, the UK or Germany. It seemed to be That's the right. only places where you could buy these things. And I always wondered why that was. Uh, so you're saying it was just some bad, you know, piss poor... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, deals, I, I guess. Mean, um, Comm said, Commodore UK thrived. You know, they only closed about 18 months after Commodore US filed for uh, bankruptcy, didn't they? Yeah, and in fact, the, the, U the um, Europe, UK was doing so well that right at the end, uh, Commodore US brought over the UK sales manager and put him in a position in the US to try and save the US business, but it was too late. We've already, we've already interviewed him. But they were, but Com Commodore UK were buying up all the stock, so they they managed to keep going. But of course, then they ran out, and there was no manufacturing they, going on. In then. in Europe, we couldn't sell enough Amigas. Yeah. We couldn't get enough. We it, it was so successful. It's interesting, and, though. And not let's sure. not forget that the uh, there were some very clever things that Commodore did. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the, first of all, remember the Amiga was an independent project. Commodore just bought it. It was it was pretty much finished. And they bought the product because they needed a new, a new product to follow on from the Commodore 64. But the Amiga 1000 was um, was too expensive to take truly to replace the Commodore 64 when it first came out. It was, you know, we're talking two thousand dollars. It was a wonderful machine, and it was a PC light years ahead of a PC, if you know what I mean. A multitasking computer with a mouse and a keyboard, and it looks fantastic, um, and everything else. But the the key machine was actually the Amiga 500. It was the A500 was closer to the replacement of the Commodore 64 because let's not forget the Commodore 64 was massive. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely massive. So that's why Commodore got a bit lazy because they thought they could just have a ready-made replacement. What they should have done was they should have engaged the computer stores all over the US, gone to them with the A1000 and explained exactly what it was. And you did have people at Commodore in the sales were trying to do this but they were always outnumbered and they were always told just get it out there let's do some deals with Toys R Us so of course if you've got Toys R Us all they want to do is is literally ring it up at the checkout uh, and away you go they're not going to do a demonstration if somebody walks up to an A1000 in Toys R Us and it's just sitting there looking pretty there's no one trained up in Toys R Us to say this is how it works it's multi what an answer questions on what multitasking is or the copper or the blitter or all sorts of other things it's not possible they don't know whereas in a computer store they're happy to talk about it 
but the computer stores weren't interested. Well, they, some were, but it just didn't take off in that respect. If they'd engaged them and used them as they should have done, as they did in the original days with the VIC-20 and then the Commodore 64, and got them on side, it probably would have been a very different story, because by the time that the A500 came out, then it could have then skyrocketed, because you would have already done the groundwork with the A1000. In another universe, they yeah. got it right. Yeah. Parallel universe. In a parallel universe, there is no Windows <laughs> 95. There's no Windows XP or, or the awful Amigas are 8 there. that I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah it was, we're all using Amigas and, and sort of like with A's on our... Yeah. On our <laughs> <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the final installment of this interview, and I might also supplement it uh, with a little special, maybe my 10 favorite Amiga games or something along those lines. So stay tuned. I know you guys will enjoy that. As always, I want to thank you very much, very, very, very much for your support of Matt Chat. It uh, really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea how awesome that is. I uh, just really appreciate your, your help with this. Uh, if you would like to support the show, just go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. And, uh, and by the way, while you're there, uh, why don't you check out Metal Jesus Rocks and Lazy Game Reviews, uh, two other really good YouTubers. If you like this show, I'm sure you'll like them too. I think you'll uh, agree that they're well worth supporting as long as you're over at the Patreon site. So uh, we all thank you for your support. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, lots of news. Uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, a little news related to this, uh, to Anthony and Nicola Caulfield. They've got a Kickstarter up right now to make a special edition uh, version of the Amiga years. They're trying to raise $22,000 to make that happen. Basically, what you'll get is a, uh, a second CD, or second DVD, rather, uh, with another 90 minutes of footage from those interviews. You know, definitely a no-brainer if you're an Amiga supporter, so go check that out. Uh, I think you can also upgrade. If you if you supported the original Kickstarter, uh, you kick in a little bit more and you get these uh, special edition versions. So uh, definitely worth uh, the time to check that out. Uh, other news, uh, there's a bit of a fiasco over at the uh, Chris Roberts uh, Space Industries and the Star Citizen game. I don't know if you guys have been following this. I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail here about it, other than just to let you know it's some uh, kind of shenanigans going on in the wake of a sort of an expose from some disgruntled employees from the uh, Star Citizen project that's uh, been published in The Escapist. Uh, Chris Roberts made this really long, impassioned uh, uh, response, basically saying it's all a, a guy named Derek Smart's uh, <laughs> problem. So uh, I'll just throw it out there. If uh, you have thoughts on it, I'd like to hear, hear them. You know, I can't pretend like I really know what's going on with that, though. So anyway, all is not well with the Star Citizen project. Very unfortunate. Uh, also, a couple other Kickstarters I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, one is called Orion, Or Orion, not, not with an O, but with an A-U, uh, Legacy of the Cory Odin. Uh, these guys are pretty cool. This is an African, it's, it's a fantasy, it's, a, well, let me back up. It's almost an action RPG uh, set in an African fantasy setting, uh, which I, I bet you probably haven't seen uh, anything quite like that before. Uh, these guys are based on the Cameroon. I'm going to try to get them on the show. Uh, I just think that's really cool to get some of these, uh, you know, uh, outside perspectives, or I guess, or, you know, a Cameroon developer. Well, why not? Sounds awesome. Uh, let's see. Another Kickstarter called Mega Magic Wizards of the New Age. Uh, this is kind of a, a medley, I guess, if you will, of uh, several different genres of games. It's <laughs> Diablo meets Pokemon meets Zelda meets Command and Conquer. Uh, that's only got nine days left. They're trying to raise a uh, 20k. Uh, so anyway, I, think I, I checked it out. It looks pretty interesting to me. But uh, you know, go check it out. See what you think. 20k is not a lot of money, and it looks like it's a pretty fun game. So I think that will do it for the news. Yeah. All right. So what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I've got a little number called the Milk Stout Nitro, America Stout. From the Left Hand Brewing Company, and uh, let's see, S super smooth with soft roastiness and mocha notes. Alcohol 6.0 percent by volume. 
Uh, let's see, ingredients, Rocky Mountain water, malted barley, lactose, <laughs> flaked oats, hops, and yeast. Want to pour the perfect nitro pint scan this. Well, I guess I won't be pouring it. Uh, the guy at the, at the store told me something about this nitro. Uh, it's got something to do with the way that it pours. You don't get that big head. It's supposed to taste more like a draft. You know, I don't pretend to understand the science behind it or anything, but I thought that sounded kind of interesting. Let's see, where are these guys out of? Uh, uh, Colorado. You know, lots and lots of good breweries in Colorado, apparently. Anyway, let's uh, get this uh, Milk Stout Nitro open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Left Hand Brewing Company's Milk Stout Nitro America Stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, smells really good. You definitely smell that sort of a uh, sort of coffee-like aroma to this. Kind of chocolatey coffee. It almost smells uh, a little bit like a glass of uh, chocolate milk. So anyway, it smells really nice. It did pour really smooth. No big, uh, <laughs> you know, head rushing up or anything like that. I always hate it when that happens. Uh, well, let's give it a taste though. A uh, really good flavor on this. It's uh, well, a little bit of, of a creamy texture, I would say. You taste that sort of light coffee, almost a, uh, what is that? It's very, very sweet uh, tasting, uh, not bitter at all. You know, some of these stouts, uh, in my experience, some of them can get quite bitter. Uh, not so here. Yeah, it's just kind of light, creamy, it's really tasty. You can really taste that sort of chocolatey uh, coffee flavors uh, that are kind of associated with these, uh, uh, the stouts. You know, it's really good stuff, really, really uh, super smooth. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just almost a, a perfect uh, stout. Really, really smooth, uh, no bitterness, uh, really uh, refreshing. You know, <laughs> what can I say? This is a, yeah, an excellent choice, a really, really good choice on this. Uh, I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, if you like the, the milk stouts or even stouts, I say uh, definitely want to try this. Uh, actually, quite good. So five out of five drinking horns for the uh, milk stout nitro. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And we were talking a little bit in the video about our originality, and I found a really good quotation that I, I really liked about it, <laughs> originality, from uh, Lawrence J. Peter. It goes something like this. Originality is the fine art of remembering what you hear, but forgetting where you heard it. See you guys next week. See you guys next week. A chat with you and somehow death loses its sting.